KETV Newswatch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. And good morning, I'm Rob McCartney. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Between now and May 15th, we're talking with all the candidates in the 2nd Congressional District, the U.S. Senate race, and those for governor. It's part of our year-long commitment to covering the issues and the people running in 2018. The Senate race, well, it's crowded. There are five Republicans. We're talking with Jack Heidel today and with Chris Janicek. He's one of the Democrats running, included Frank Svoboda, who is not pictured here. There is also one Libertarian in the race, Jim Schultz. And we want to begin this morning with Democrat Chris Janicek. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you, Rob, for having me. You bet. So um, we have about 10 minutes to discuss the issues. Okay. And you're a small business owner. Yes. Uh, why are you running? I am running. Um, I am frustrated with the lunacy going on in Washington, D.C. right now. And uh, the common denominator with the state of Nebraska is that all of our representatives are Republicans and they're right in the thick of it. Uh, government was meant to be for the people, by the people, and of the people. And I just don't see it. I see them serving their self-interest and what they can do for them and not representing the people of Nebraska. Gotcha. You have a business called Chris Janicek's Cake Box. Cake Box? Yeah, on your website you say, your resume reads like a Hollywood screenplay, <laughs> state dinners at the White House, catering trailers on blockbuster movie sets. Can you explain all that? Well, in the early 90s I worked at the protocol department in the White House under the Clinton administration. And uh, we planned state dinners for heads of state and, and uh, representatives from our states here in the, in the United States. and. Got to meet a lot of people, a lot of celebrities. That was uh, the Clinton administration, Streisand, Michael Jackson, Sally Field. Um, we're always guests and coming and going. Can I yeah. pick up these names that you, you just dropped there? Drop them down. <laughs> but what about these blockbuster movies? Well, I became friends with Alexander Payne early oh. on, and I uh, worked on his first movie about Schmidt. And hmm. if you watch the movie, The Woodman Tower Cake, that was our first foray into that. And ever since then, I've done uh, cakes for all of his movies. And through him and his connections, I got to meet Shirley MacLaine, Jack Nicholson, um, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, so I guess I had a, a creative writer write that for me. So, I, get, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Hey, let's talk some of the issues. The economy. Uh, what obstacles do you face as a small business owner that you would like to remove, or are there any? There, you know what? Nebraska's economy is rocking along. We are doing really well here. Um, I saw the numbers today. Unemployment is an all-time low, which is great. Uh, I will give credit to the current administration for that and the previous administration that set everything in play. Uh, what I think as a small business owner, the pricing that fluctuates the most with our raw goods like eggs and flour and sugar and such, uh, as the markets go up and down, we have to adjust for that profit and loss margins and such. Um, my employees all receive a living wage. They are all paid at $12 an hour starting off, but most of them are making between $15 and $18 an hour, and I think that's a huge part of what is missing in our economy right now. Um, a lot of people look at that as businesses are going to lose money and have to close their doors. But what really happens is people take that money and they go out and spend it. And it's pumped right back into the economy. Rather than earning 7 or $8 an hour, this gives them the financial uh, stability, independence, to, to help spread the money around. President Trump uh, signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Would you have uh, supported that? I would have voted no on that. Uh, we don't need any tax cuts. 80% of the population didn't want the tax cut bill. Uh, and what was attached to it was the uh, corporate reduction tax. Now, they could have dropped that to 27%, 29% from the 35%. But I think they went as low as uh, 23%. Right. And these corporations are receiving billions and billions of dollars back. Now, that's not going to go into the economy like they had planned it to be. That's going right into the pocket of these corporations. And they're going to buy stock back. Uh, they're going to pay bigger bonuses. They may reinvest a little bit in the business. But everyone has to understand, you're not going to hire more people to work your business unless there's more demand for your product. Okay, but you, some people may take issue when you say no one wanted the tax cut. Well, maybe a lot of people say, "Hey, uh, no, I want a tax okay. cut." My employees, through their paychecks, I notice most of them are getting between fifteen and twenty-five dollars right. more. Okay? okay, but come three years from now, they're going to lose all their deductions. They're going to have to start paying that, and that tax cut goes away, and then they're going to get socked. Meanwhile, the corporate tax cut mm -hmm. stays. That goes nowhere. Right. You know yep. exactly. And when our representatives from this state of Nebraska were questioned about that. 
a lot of them said, well, you know what, the next administration can deal with it. Would you have uh, supported the recent government shutdown? No. I don't think government should shut down for any reason. There are too many lives and livelihoods at stake. We have a lot of people in Nebraska that work for the government. The fear and the jeopardy of, of not knowing where their next paycheck was coming from. Uh, Republicans and Democrats need to come together and make some common sense uh, agreements on things instead of my way or the highway or I don't agree with you say you know so let's just let it shut down and and talk about procrastination these officials wait till the last minute to decide on anything and then they ram it through I don't know if you saw the the budget that was just passed the Democrats mm -hmm. basically got everything they wanted because nobody read it mm -hmm. No cuts for Planned Parenthood, no funding for a border wall. Although President Trump thought he was getting funding for a border wall, it explicitly says this money will not be used for any type of physical construction right. of a wall. It is just going to be used to maintain and provide current monies for the, the current situation. Yeah, and they and Congress refused actually to tie any of the, the, exactly. the DACA funding to the to the. Let's omnibus. talk about DACA. A yeah, lot I want of your, to ask you, what okay. would you do? What would you do to solve that problem? A lot of your viewers probably don't even know what DACA stands for. It's Deferred Action for Early Childhood Arrivals. Mm -hmm. These are children that were brought here by their parents at an early age, three, four, five, ten. They know no other home than the United States of America. Where are you going to take them and ship them? Who is mm -hmm. going to pay for it? They're all educated. They all have jobs. We have over 60,000 DACA members in the military, and they are not U.S. citizens, and they are protecting this country. Now, they need to be afforded citizenship. And if we have to set up some kind of curriculum that they can go through for the next two years, and they probably already know everything about the United States that they have to, pass a test, pay a fee, and welcome to the United States of America. You are now a citizen. Contribute to the economy and, and to the livelihood of this country. Would you, I'm going to, I'm going to go on a limb here and say you don't support a wall, uh, but the, the president said he would like the Pentagon to pay for it. Okay. Mexico is going to pay for the wall, Rob. He said it over mm -hmm. and over and over. So why is this burden of a wall now being passed on to the American taxpayer? Everyone out in TV land, I want you to understand, this is our money. This is money we send to the United States government, and this money should be reinvested into our country. Infrastructure is one way. Mm -hmm. Still sitting on the table. Nothing's been approved. We have a $1.7 trillion tax scam, is what I like to call it, that benefits the wealthy. And we also now have a $1.3 trillion budget. So we just added $3 trillion to our deficit, which last month was at a record $21 trillion. Trump promised that he would take the deficit to zero within seven years. Mm -hmm. I've seen him almost quadruple it in terms of a yearly increase in one year. Yep. And our representatives say nothing. I think the deficit uh, actually 666 bill and the debt. The debt is yeah is a 21 trillion. Thank you for the correction. No, just that way because people. But you can tell up my passion for this. Absolutely, I, mean, I can. I am beyond frustrated. Yep. This is the last place I thought I'd be running for office. But somebody's got to do something. And my grandmother always told me, you know, be the change if you want to see the change. And so here I am, people, and I am going to work for the state of Nebraska. Talking about passion, I mean, you're, you're pretty vocal on social media. Yes, I, I, see I am. Like in Facebook. And, yes, and I am. Do you think, if elected, you could work with President Trump? I mean, compromise can often be the name of the game to get anything done. Correct. There are three branches of government, though, Rob. Mm -hmm. There is the Senate and there is the House of Representatives, together known as Congress. And we have the executive branch, which is known as the president. Mm -hmm. The job of the Congress is to hold the executive branch in check. Right now, we have an unbalanced House and we have an unbalanced Senate with the Republicans controlling everything. Mm -hmm. And nothing is getting done. And all of our representatives from Nebraska are Republican. Again, the only time I think they seem to need us or acknowledge us is when there's a vote that they need. We're treated as disposable here. This state has so much to offer. We could talk about the NAFTA, the free trade agreement between Mexico and Canada. There's nothing wrong with it. Let's improve on it. Why do you want to mess with it? Mm -hmm. You know, the argument can be made they're importing more than we're exporting or we're exporting more. Who cares? It's free trade. It's all based on su supply and demand. In my cupcake shops, there are weekends where we'll sell 7,000 cupcakes because the College World Series is in town or Berkshire Hathaway is having their meeting. And then there are weekends where it's rainy and it's cloudy and there's no event in town and no one in Omaha is coming to the old market to walk around and we sell 150 cupcakes. But it all works out in the end. That's 
on a larger scale, that is how the North American Free Trade Agreement is right. operating. Don't mess with it. My job as your senator would be to find other ways that we can increase Nebraska trade. You know, we have so many smart people in this state. We need to retain those people in this state. There is uh, ethanol. We could be the world leader in ethanol as an alternative fuel, and we're not pursuing it. Wind power. Right. Look at Iowa, all over the place, generating all kinds of income. We could also do solar. We have we have sun, we have nine months of sun in this in this state. I mean, the the opportunities are endless, okay. and we're just not taking advantage of them. All right, and we don't have much time left, right. but we want to give you a minute so you can make a final uh, plea, if you will, to your to your voters, possible. So right there to that camera, we'll you look have right a minute. Right in that camera. Sure. Okay, possible voters. First, what I need you to do is get out and vote. One of the things I want to do as your new senator is make. Uh, education affordable and attainable for everyone. Education will lift us out of poverty, get people off welfare, and they will have a sustainability where we don't have to send them a check every month. Number two, health care. You are entitled to the same health care that I or anyone that's an elected official deserves in Washington, D.C. Number three, human rights. I will make sure on every issue that human rights are taken into accord on sexuality, on gender, on women or men, on religion. These are human rights are under attack. So if these are things that you care about, I want you to get out and vote. May 15th is a primary, and if I make it through that, I'll see you in, in November. All right. Chris Janicek, thank you very much for joining us. This thank morning. you, Rob. You bet. Nice so, interview. All right. Thank you very much. Up next, we're going to talk with the Republican Jack Heidel. You're watching KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. You're watching KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. This morning, we're talking with two more of the 10 candidates running for Senate. And joining me now is Republican Jack Heidel. Dr. Heidel, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, first off, I need to ask you, why are you running? Well, I'm running because of our debt, our national debt. It, it's awful. It's, it's enormous. Uh, it's out of control. It's getting worse all the time. And the incumbent, uh, Deb Fisher, is not is ignoring it. I mean, from a practical, she wouldn't say that she's ignoring it, but from a practical point of view, she's ignoring it. So. You're on the Learning Community Council. You ran twice for that. You right. also ran for Congress in 2012. Now you're running for the Senate. Um, why keep running? Well, um, because of, I'm running this time because of the debt. In fact, in 12, I, I was running because, I mean, I, my platform was to eliminate the deficit. Lee Terry was incumbent, mm -hmm. and I was trying to pin the deficit on him, which was, it was a stretch. I mean, people said, oh, yes, the deficit's awful, but Lee Terry's not responsible. Well, now, you know, the debt is awful and getting much worse. And I, I'm making, I think I have a compelling argument that Deb Fisher and most of our Republican leaders are responsible because they've made it worse. I mean, they're not making it better and they're making it worse. Okay, you, you call on your website, you call yourself a, a non-ideological fiscal conservative and that if elected, you would focus on the deficit and, and debt reduction on your first day of the job. Now, we do have some numbers I want to show everyone. The federal government finished fiscal 2017 with a budget deficit of $666 billion. That was an increase of $80 billion over the previous year. As for the debt, uh, it was, what, $21 trillion now. Spending went up by 3%, but receipts were only about 1%, so a 2% difference right, there right, right, significantly. Right. How do you realistically turn those things around? Well, it's, it's a huge, it's a very difficult problem to do. Mm -hmm. Intelligent budgeting, uh, sensible budgeting would help a lot. I mean, in other words, the budget process that we went through this spring, or a few months ago, last couple months, mm -hmm. was, was awful. In other words, let's, let's raise the military budget by 10%, let's raise domestic spending by 10%. If, you know, and the, both sides agreed, you know, they would support each other and, do, and raise domestic and military by 10%, mm -hmm. that, that's terribly inefficient and, and irresponsible. I mean, maybe we need increases, uh, some increases, but we should have offsets as well. You don't just raise everything by 10%. That's crazy. That's very irresponsible. But more than that, a, a much bigger thing, We've got to get entitlements under control. And to get entitlements under control, we need to get health care spending under control. So that is really, that's the key to solving our, our, our debt problem and our rising, increasing deficits, is to get the cost of health care under control. And we need to move to a system, private and, you know, we have private health care, employer provided, we have Medicare, we have Medicaid. We need to get to a system where individuals have more skin in the game, have more per need have to accept and, and, and uh, show personal responsibility for their own health care costs. So that, that's, 
See, that's what we don't, in both provider, uh, employer provided care, you know, basically everything's covered. I mean, there, there's nothing, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, there's no limits on it. I mean, you, everything is, is covered. The same in, in Medicare. I mean, basically you're covered for everything. Um, in the Medicare, I'm, I'm on Medicare now, but the Medicare people only pay 25%. In other words, the premiums and co-pays that they, they pay are right. only 25% of the cost. And so, uh, and, and it's not very expensive for the recipients, of course, but what we're not paying for, it. the government is paying for it, you know, 75% of the cost. So that, there is no, there's a lack of sense of personal responsibility in, in Medicare. And of course, the same thing is true for employer-provided care. And that's what we have to deal right. with. We, we need to make people, individuals, more responsible you know, for their own, for the cost of their own health care. And there are ways to do that. But, you know, it's going to be, we're, you know, people are going to have to make a sacrifice. I mean, we have this huge problem. And there's, of course, part of the problem is that there's low public awareness. There's apathy and low awareness of the debt problem because mm -hmm. interest rates are so low. But they're going to go up. And then the debt is going to become very, right. very significant and, and very much very problematic, you know. Would you have voted for President Trump's tax cuts? No, even though I like the idea of lowering the corporate tax rate and mm -hmm. some of the other provisions, they're excellent, but it, it increases our debt by a trillion dollars over 10 years. And that's after growth is taken into account. In other words, the tax cuts themselves were a trillion and a half, but there will be a half trillion of, of, of growth mm -hmm. uh, you know, because of the tax cuts. I mean, according to the experts, and I believe them. So that's a net trillion dollars added to the debt. So I, what I would have done, and this is, this is why really I'm, I'm in the race, is because three, there, last fall there were three, uh, no, there were 52 Republicans, okay? Three of them, three Republicans could have insisted on making the, tax, the new tax bill uh, revenue neutral. I mean, just three, right? Of 52, if three had said, we will not support this unless it's revenue neutral, they could have accomplished that. So just three of them. So, and and none, of them, none of them did. And Deb Fisher could have. I mean, she's no worse than the others, but she's not any better than the others. So mm -hmm. three of them could have made it uh, revenue neutral and therefore not adding to the debt. And they didn't do it. And that's, what, that's the specific uh, thing that, that, that tripped me, you know, got me, tripped me, to, uh, you know, me off to, to get into the, the raise. What happens if we don't? Turn around the debt, turn around the deficit. Well, it's, it's, we're going to have a huge fiscal crisis. I mean, this is going to be a huge burden, first of all, on, on future generations. Obviously, it's enormous debt. I mean, we'll be, you know, we might get, we might get by for 10 years or 15 years. You know, we can't, we, there will be a huge fiscal crisis. And, you know, when, it's hard to say. It depends on how, how interest rates go up and a lot of things. But there will be a huge fiscal crisis. And it's going to be, you know, the, the future generations who, who are going to suffer from this, who are going to have to deal with it. it. It's going to lower our stature in the world. You know, people, other countries will, will, will be less likely or less interested in buying our debt. In fact, China is already, I mean, there was an article in the last couple of days, mm -hmm. China is going to slow down on its purchases of, of our debt. That's probably going to raise interest rates. Right. Just, just, I mean, this isn't just in the last few days. Okay. But that's going to happen massively when our debt gets, you know, as, as it gets worse and worse. Right, let me ask you some other issues here. Gun control, should teachers be armed? Well, I don't think, I don't think that's the solution to gun control. I, I have actually, and by the way, I, I, I fully support the Second Amendment, uh, gun rights, you know, the, the right to keep and bear arms will not be infringed. Okay, but the, the only way, and, and, I, and I also support uh, uh, in, uh, you know, t toughening up background checks mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, things like that, but the only way, the only effective way we're going to deal with, with um, curtail mass shootings is with a ban on assault weapons. So I, I support a ban on assault weapons. And I think it's not a contradiction. I mean, people are telling me all the time, well, then you're, you're, you, know, you don't believe in the Second Amendment. You want to repeal the Second Amendment. Well, I don't want to repeal the Second Amendment. I, I support the Second Amendment. I, I believe we can compromise between keeping a Second Amendment for you know, protections, mm -hmm. uh, personal protection, and dealing with curtailing mass shootings by, by you know, okay. the general public does not need assault weapons, okay. and so that's the way to deal with that. Let me ask you, immigration it continues to be an issue. You suggested that getting rid of the 30,000 illegal immigrants in Nebraska would create a huge workforce shortage. Right. Because, What's the solution? Yeah, okay, because we have such a low unemployment rate in Nebraska, mm -hmm. that we have a labor shortage. You just round up those 30,000 illegal immigrants, that's, that's the number that's generally used, and, and it's going to be a huge blow to the Nebraska economy. So what we should do is have a a sensible guest worker visa program mm -hmm. so that employers, if, if they cannot find enough local help, you know, local workers for their, to run their businesses, then they can hire immigrants. They can legally hire immigrants to make up the rest of, of the workforce that they need to conduct mm -hmm. their business. And it would be, these would be temporary. I mean, they would be, 
you know, visa, it'd be legal. It'd be legal. I, it'd sure. be legal employment, but it, they'd be temporary guest worker visas. And, and this would, uh, to me, this is the way to to reform uh, a general way to reform immigration. You served in the with the Navy for a couple of years. Yeah, right, right. Fifty nine, sixty one. Uh, would you authorize more spending for the military? Look, I'm I'm a, <laughs> totally in favor of 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 a strong military. And yes, we'll have to increase military spending, but it should be intelligent spend, I mean, intelligent increases. For example, here's a, th we have 800 overseas bases in 180 different countries. You know, overseas bases. Now it's hard to close domestic bases, of course, for obvious reasons. You know, they provide jobs and so on and so forth. But these are 800 overseas bases. Why do we need that many overseas bases in 180 different countries? 37 in Japan. Japan's our ally, our friend. You know, I'm sure that if there was a rational approach taken, we could, I don't know how many foreign bases we could cut, but I mean, if we, we don't need 800 overseas bases. That's crazy. Let, let's, let's cut, let's, let's save. I mean, there's waste in the military. Let's, where there is waste, where we can identify it, such as for overseas bases, let's cut it out and then use that money for, you know, to, when we need the increases. And finally, I want to ask you, um, you call yourself a, a social moderate who is willing to take stands at odds with Republican orthodoxy. Why do you think that'll fly with Republican voters in a primary? Yeah, well, I, what I'm trying to establish by saying this is that I'm, see, that I'm serious about A lot of people saying, well, okay, well, we, we all, everybody deplores the, de the deficit, but, but you're, de you're not going to be any different than anybody mm -hmm. else. You'll get, in, you'll get in office and you'll be just as bad. You won't do anything about it. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm trying to make the case that I will do something about it. I mean, it's my, I'm saying it's my focus, but I'm willing to take unpopular positions. I mean, for example, ban on assault weapons, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an right. example. Immigration uh, reform in terms of, of a guest worker visa program. Th these are things that are not overwhelmingly popular with Republicans, although I think they make a lot of sense. And so uh, I'm willing to take these positions, which will offend some Republicans, right. and, I'm, I'm, and, I, and I believe in these, but I'm also doing this in, in the campaign publicly to show that I'm willing to take unpopular stand. And the debt is it's going to be a huge problem. So, right. I mean, a lot, most people don't want to deal with it. Right. And it's going to be a huge right. problem. We have to, but, and people are going to have to make sacrifices. I tell you, what I want, we don't have much time left, but I want to give you a minute. You can make a final pitch to voters here. You can talk about that. You have one minute and just go ahead right to the camera there. Okay, well, as, I, as has come out already in this uh, interview, I'm running for this office because of the national debt and, and, and the fact that it's so, it's enormous, it's out of control, and we need people in Washington, national leaders, who are willing to do whatever it takes to reduce it. If we don't, we're going to have a huge fiscal crisis. And I've have, I have lots of ideas. We've talked about some tonight. Others are on my website, Jack Idol for Senate. But it simply, it is my focus. It's what we need to do. And uh, it, it's what, what I would start doing from, from day one. I mean, if elected, this is where I will spend my time. And I, what I'm trying to do, you know, I'm, ra I'm running against the debt. I'm trying to raise awareness of the debt issue. And to me, uh, running against an incumbent who is complacent and ignoring the debt is, you know, the best thing I can think of to, as a way of, uh, of dealing with, with, with a debt issue. So that, that is the entire focus of my campaign, to, to, to talk about the debt, to, yeah. to make the case that I am serious and I will do something about it okay. if um, elected. All right, Jack Heidel, thanks very much for joining us. And we're going to be right back with a few final thoughts. First, a reminder, your comments are an important part of the show. If you want to be heard, email them to news at KETV.com. Love hearing from you, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to this special commitment 2018 edition of KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. For the next several weeks, we'll be talking with the candidates running for U.S. Senate. Today, we talked with Democrat Chris Janicek and Republican Jack Heidel. Their interviews are online, along with the two candidates we talked with last week, Libertarian Jim Schultz and Democrat Larry Marvin. We here at KETV News Watch 7 want you to be well informed when you vote. I'm Rob McCartney. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here next Sunday morning.